I'm Jay Kingley, co-founder and CEO of Maven, your host of Fractionals Unplugged. I'm joined today by Nate Jensen, a fractional CFO who has been working in finance for the last 15 years, the last 10 in a fractional capacity. Nate, you started down the fractional path way before it became the in thing to do. You know, I never really thought of thought of it as following the crowd. It, it seemed to make a lot more sense than being a W two for, well, forever. <laughs> a lot more leverage than working for yourself. I hear you. Nate focuses on serving general contractors, typically with five to thirty employees. Nate is based in Lehigh, Utah. Welcome to the show, Nate. Thank you, Jay. Welcome to Fractionals Unplugged, an insider's perspective vodcast and podcast from Maven. We work with fractional executives to recreate their corporate income without the insane hours, building the business they want on their own terms. Jay Kingley, the co-founder and CEO of Maven, shares best practices along with tips and tricks on how you can build a robust pipeline to become fully booked with clients, start getting paid what you're worth, and eliminate your brute force marketing. Enjoy today's episode. Nate, I'm a general contractor with 20 employees. We bump into each other for the first time at a business event. You've got a maximum of 60 seconds to give me your elevator pitch. Go! What I do for my clients is create a financial dashboard. This dashboard lets them make really good financial decisions. Most companies, they, they run a business like they're playing a game of chess with a blindfold on. What I provide helps them take off that blindfold. They can see exactly what's going on, and that dashboard shows them what decision is going to lead to higher profitability, higher cash flow, uh, and it's, it, everything just becomes clear. Nate, I have never seen a path to success based on the foundation of ignorance. Without the data, without facing the truth and reality, how do you ever get there? You know, I, I think you don't for the most part. Uh, one of the things I've, I've been told many, many times is I'd rather be good than lucky. Because if I'm good, I can again and again and again. If I get lucky once, I better hang on to everything I made because it's, it's not likely to happen again. And the only way to really be good is to know, here's where I'm at. Here's where I want to get to. Here's the gap. And if you have a very simple way to see that, uh, that tells you again, what do you have to do to bridge that gap? You can make those choices. If you have no way to see that, no way to really know what that gap is, you're just taking a shot in the dark and, and hoping you get lucky. Replicate and repeat. Absolutely. Yeah. Keys to sustained success. Now, Nate, mm -hmm. why do your clients need what you do? What are their pain points that you're addressing? You know, it's not that complicated, Jay. Uh, most company or most people who start a small business, they want to make money. Now, a lot of people go into small business because they have a passion, right? Maybe they start a restaurant because they love a certain kind of food that they cook or whatever it is. But every single small business has to make a profit. And if they don't, they're going to go out of business. And so when it comes to general contractors, uh, same thing. They've got to make sure that every job is profitable. They've got to make sure that they're not overpaying their employees. Uh, they've got to understand if it's better to hire a, a subcontractor to fulfill something versus using their internal employees. And without the data, they just don't know. They, they maybe have a gut feel, and some people actually can get quite a ways on that. But to really grow, to really expand, to really hit the goals that you, that you have for your, your business and your life, Having the data takes away that, that financial mystery and says, here's what you've got to do to make money. Do this, do this, you know, push this button, pull this lever, uh, do that for three months, six months, and suddenly you turn your business around and you're, you're doing great. So it, it's really that. It's people make money. So when you can get rid of that pain, talk what I to do me about the outcomes that your clients can expect to achieve when they work with you. So their outcomes, what they would look like to the client, uh, the main thing really is, is an increased sense of freedom and control over their own life. Uh, if you're looking inside their business, they're going to be, well, one, they'll have more cash flow, which provides the ability to, whether you know, outsource stuff, hire people to do the stuff you don't want to do, or outsource it to a subcontractor. 
But basically in your business, you're doing those things that either you really want to do or that you're really, really good at, which for a lot of people tends to be picking up new business. But it also gives them that new control outside of that because when you're on, in your personal time, well, first you have more personal time usually because you've streamlined your business a little bit, but you have fewer constraints, generally meaning you have more money because your business is doing well. So if you started a business because you love travel, for example, and yet you're working all the time, so you don't have time to travel, plus you don't have the money to travel. Well, suddenly if you have a successful business, you've freed up some of your time and you've created that resource where you can go and do what you like. One of the things I, I love about what it is you do is that, you know, they always say that if you've got a sexy business, you're going to be the hit of every social gathering of every cocktail party. But when you look at it, it's really hard to make money within a business, which is which everybody wants to be in because you have so much competition mm -hmm. and your margins get really compressed. But what you're doing is you're supplying foundational blocking and tackling elements to your clients, which are essential for them to actually make money in your business. And I think you've picked a target market of general contractors, which are pretty critical, but no one looks at them as, oh my God, I wish I were you. <laughs> I don't know if anybody looks at them and says, I wish I were you. Uh, those in that industry know it's, uh, it can be pretty cutthroat and uh, cash flow is always a big issue. Um, I, I'm not a big believer in the flashy thing, the sexy thing. Um, a lot of people, business is an art and they think I'm going to create this huge, this great product. Uh, again, the sexy product, one that people are really you know attracted to. For me, business is a science. You know, again, it goes back to if you know your numbers, you can say, push this button, pull this lever, do this again, and again, and suddenly you're making money. Uh, I've, I've started businesses in the past that I kind of don't count because I never really got off the ground that I thought, oh, this would be so cool. This is such a great idea. Um, but it took a lot of explaining, it took a lot of helping time to help people understand what I was even trying to do. And, and it's, it's really, really challenging, but something like, you know, financial consulting or accounting consulting, or, Hey, a simple dashboard that says, here's what you need to know about your business. If you really want to run it efficiently, uh, it's a simple idea. Uh, and yet very effective, and very powerful. You know, that's a great segue into my next question, which is what do you know that your clients don't know, but should, I know why they're not making money or as much money as they think they could, as, as they should really. Uh, and that's what it comes down to. Uh, most people, most small business owners that I've worked with at some point in their career had the mindset that if I just grow my business enough, then I'll be successful. Then I'll make, be making the money that I want. turns out there's sort of a tipping point where you get to a certain point in your business. When you grow past that, you actually start to lose money or at least decrease those profits. And so an understanding of how to get past that threshold to where growth actually increases profit instead of decreases profit. Uh, that's what I know. Now it's different for every business. And so obviously I don't know until I see their numbers and provide that dashboard, but that's it. Yeah. How do you actually grow and make more money instead of less money? So fundamental. I love it. Just to continue this theme, what do you think differentiates you from other fractional CFOs who could serve your same target market? You know, they're, there are several things. I think the first one really is that I, I do focus on my dashboard as a product. Uh, uh, an outsourced CFO can be pretty pricey. Uh, and I do do that for some of my clients. I do provide sort of an ongoing support, monthly reviews and so forth. But a lot of companies, uh, especially if you're more on the end of the, like the five employees side of the, the spectrum, uh, it can get so expensive that uh, it, it's more convenient to have the, just have that data in front of you. So I really like to help my clients understand their own numbers instead of saying, Hey, I want you to always keep me around, always be super important so that you have to pay me, uh, all the, you know, forever. Uh, I provide a way for them to see their numbers constantly. And I also teach them how to read those dashboards so that they can look at them and understand, Oh, I see this, this, uh, metric is, uh, you know, below the target. That's a red flag. And I know some of the basic steps I need to do to get it above the target. So, uh, that, that's really the main difference is 
providing that dashboard as a resource for them rather than having them have to rely on me indefinitely. So let's shift a little bit from talking about the challenges of your clients to talking about your challenges. So what would you say are the biggest challenges you faced in building your fractional CFO business? For me, it's, it's always lead generation. I've found in my industry in, uh, you know, in accounting and finance, the, the industry is actually getting less competitive in terms of uh, other accountants. Like people are not going into this field very much. <laughs> and so once I get in front of somebody and I'm able to explain what I do, uh, I generally am able to, to build my clientele pretty well. But for me, it's just finding good ways to get in front of people, whether it's you know, networking or, or being on a podcast or uh, e- you know, direct email or something. And I found for me, being able to be in front of somebody and, and talk like networking or being on a podcast sort of seems to work a lot better than you know, just sending out a blast email, which is just not my thing, I guess. So out of curiosity, Nate, if you looked at what I think most people would say are traditional lead gen techniques and channels, things like cold email, cold calling, cold reach out on LinkedIn, how much do you enjoy doing I do. <laughs> On a scale of one to 10, it's less than one. Less than one, like minus yeah. five, right? Minus yeah, 10. Like that. And, and I think for our audience, there's a big lesson here, which we see time and time again which is you may have an approach or a technique that works really well, but if you don't want to do it, you aren't going to do it. Yeah. The good news is there's lots of ways to do lead generation. There's lots of things you can do to get in front of people. And the whole art is to marry what works with what it is that you want to do and stay away from doing all those activities that you just can't stand doing no matter how effective some third party uh, tells you they are. So Nate, what advice would you give to other fractional executives? Yeah, a lot. I, would, I, I can talk a lot and I, I could give them a lot of, uh, a lot of things I would change and, and things I have done in the past. Uh, as far as building, building my business, uh, just kind of what you just said, right? Find something that you enjoy in terms of, of lead generation. I actually built an entire business that I sold a little over a year ago on a, on a podcast, right? Like I found one podcast that actually hit my target market. So specifically each time I was a guest, I'd pick up five or six clients and, and it was perfect and I enjoyed it. So, uh, not only enjoy it, but find what works and feel free to focus on that. I think don't feel like you need seven or eight different sources of lead generations, find one or two that work and that you enjoy and just again, do it again and again and again. Uh, the other thing, the other piece I would thing I would advise, and this is less in the building of the business, but more just in the, the long-term planning, uh, is understand where you want to go with it. And this is where I've, I, I've changed my focus on this business a little bit, is I do want something that's scalable, that can grow beyond myself, sound as a fractional CFO. Even when I've been able to bring other employees in to help with a lot of the work, I'm still always the bottleneck. And so I'm always looking for how do I productize what I do so that it can expand beyond me. Great advice for the other fractionals in our audience. Now we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to learn a bit about Nate. As a fractional executive, you work with us to help you recreate your corporate income without working the insane hours. Our fractional flycast service focuses on how to price, package, and position your years of experience and expertise, create and refine your go-to-market strategy so it's effective and efficient, and execute. Working with us, you will build a robust pipeline to become fully booked, start getting paid what you're worth, and eliminate your brute force marketing. Maven's unique fractional catalyst service for those serving startups and early stage companies gets you acting like a venture capitalist in managing your business and as an entrepreneur when working with your clients. Achieve financial security and reward with clients who want you to take charge. Ask for forgiveness, not permission, in an environment without all the politics and bureaucracy you find in corporate. Email j.kingley at referabilitymaven.com to learn more. Welcome back. 
We're talking to Nate Jensen, a fractional CFO, serving general contractors with five to 30 employees. Nate, let's find out a bit more about you. Let me start with, what's your biggest professional accomplishment? My biggest professional accomplishment is starting my third business. Uh, And when I say starting it, it's because that was actually my first successful business, which if you do the math, that means I failed two businesses prior to that. I I had every reason to give up. Uh, I failed two businesses over you know several years, and I lost a lot of money. I was in my my probably mid twenties by that point. You knew, like in my heart of hearts, that I was never going to recover. I was so far upside down financially. I thought I was just done for the rest of my life. But I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I knew there was leverage there, and for me that was a big big thing, big key. And so I started a third time. I was a little smarter by that point um, in the way I started, you know, minimize my risk. And guess what? Minimizing my risk seemed to have worked. I actually built up a clientele and was able to sell that business um, for more than I had lost on the two previous businesses combined. And so by the time I finished that business, I felt like, hey, maybe I can actually figure this thing out. But really it was starting that that said, hey, I'm, I'm going to, you know, continue. Uh, that I would say is my biggest accomplishment is just pushing through the failure. And what was the nature of the third business? What what was it about? Uh, It was just a bookkeeping business. Uh, It was kind of the beginning really of my fractional services. I was at that point, I really was just a bookkeeper with maybe a little bit of controllership uh, skills, but I was the guy I was, you know, clients would outsource their entire accounting department to me, which uh, for the size of client I was working with was essentially bookkeeping. But I got really good at it, um, and yeah, I'm glad I glad I figured that piece out because once I sold it, I felt like I had a a much more you know secure foundation to launch the next thing. Well, it just shows that old adage of every journey starts with the first step. In your case, you didn't actually get moving until the third step, but <laughs> I, I like the fact that you persevered and kept at it and. Uh, you know, put you on the right path. So let's go to the other side, which Mm -hmm. is what's been your biggest professional failure? What did you learn from it? And how did it shape what you do today? Yeah. So easily the the biggest failure was my first business. Um, It was, it was a franchise actually. So I went into debt right away to get it started. And it was, I mean, it, it did okay. I, don't know, I wouldn't even say it did okay. It, it survived for about two and a half years. Uh, I tripped along. And I, again, I was young at that point in my low twenties and I, I just didn't have the understanding. I think the irony of that one is if I knew what I knew now in terms of accounting, I would have been able to make it work. Uh, I'll give you an example, very simply the, the, the main metrics I think every bit business needs to know is their break even point. How do I, how much do I have to sell in a month? just to stay in business. And I had no clue at that age that such a thing even existed. It never occurred to me to think about a break even point. And if I just known that, or, Hey, you need this much in sales to hit $5,000 a monthly profit or something, I would have this target and be like, Oh, you know what? That, that I'm here. That's, you know, that's where I need to get to to do is this much business. And I'm there. There was just sort of this black void out there that I had no idea what I had to do to succeed. I just knew I was not making as much money as I needed, as I needed to. I was burning out more and more every day until I finally just said, I can't do this anymore. And I walked away from it. And it wasn't like bad accounting that made me go out of business. Um, although there was a small factor there. Uh, but if I had had good accounting and good reporting and understood what I was looking at, that could have made all the difference. So, yeah. so that has had a big, big impact on what I'm doing now yeah. is Standing it from the side of failing a business because I didn't have that information. It's more easy for me, I think, to see how that information can benefit a business owner. And again, it goes back to what I said before, push this button, pull this lever, you know, do this thing. And then you're there. And that's, that's, it's a science. So yeah, it's a very personal experience for me, but it's repeatable for sure. Well, one of the things that you learned in your early twenties that I see a lot of very seasoned fractional executives uh, who still haven't learned the lesson is this, I'm just getting by. I'm sort of bumbling and Mm -hmm. stumbling, but I am not on the path to success. But because you're not 
going directly into the pit of misery. You just sort of hang with it, but you never get anywhere. And at yeah. some point you run out of energy, you run out of desire. And, and frankly, you can run out of runway if you're mm-hmm. having, if your business is break even, but you're having to finance your life from your savings that only goes so far. So I tell all the clients that we work with, do not allow your fractional practice to just bump along for too long before you figure out exactly what you need to do to get to your destination and have a thriving business. You're one of the fortunate ones that you learned that early, but I think that's something we have to learn no matter what the age sooner, or I should say earlier is definitely better than later. I think it's the same, whether you're a business owner or a fractional you know, person or even an employee. I mean, I see employees who will tolerate a job for years and maybe decades. If it's a horrible, horrible job, they'll quit and they'll go find something they enjoy. But the sad, the sad thing is when it's tolerable, they will tolerate it and kind of get by on this. What could be such a much more fulfilling existence. Mm. Uh, if they had, a, if they had a terrible job that would force them to quit versus one that they can, can tolerate for a long time. So I think, I think it's the same thing. It's, it's, if you're going to design your life, which for me re- requires having some, you know, having control over my income, uh, which is why I do what I do, uh, make it what you want, right? Don't, don't shoot through the middle, uh, aim high. So Nate, what makes you great at what you do? So th- this is kind of interesting. I, a lot of people grow up to be accountants and somehow, I don't know how, but somehow they know that's what they're going to do. And so they go to college, they get a bachelor's in accounting, then they get their master's in accounting and then they get their CPA. And right out of college, they start working for the big four doing audit work, which I've seen people do that. I can't understand how anybody can put themselves through that. Uh, I actually got a bachelor's degree in marketing, had no interest in accounting whatsoever. Uh, but I couldn't make any money in marketing. So I'm not very good at it. And so uh, I stumbled into bookkeeping because I knew how to use QuickBooks a little bit. And when I started there, I actually realized there was so much structure and order in this accounting thing. And I uh, ended up going back to school to take a few, you know, thinking I was just going to take a couple of classes to kind of short my accounting knowledge. Ended up just loving the managerial and cost accounting classes that I took. I learned about the CMA, Certified Management Accountant. I started studying for that, got that designation, went back and got a master's in forensic accounting. Through this whole time, I was working in small business. Okay, so I never went and did audit work. I never worked for the big four, never did tax work. Uh, But every day I would go to class or I'd study something for the CMA and I would be like, oh my gosh, that's so powerful. I can see how a business who put that, you know, use that formula to calculate a number could learn so much about their business. And yet I'm in small businesses. And so they don't have like a team of accountants who do this stuff because it's, you know, part of just how the business runs. And so I got very good at using things like QuickBooks and Excel and saying, okay, how do I get what data I out of QuickBooks and into Excel so I can analyze it? And then that turned into how does someone have to get data into QuickBooks in the first place so that you can then export it to Excel? And then Excel actually became a stumbling block for me. I, I spent years in Excel and I'm, I got very, very good at it um, and found there's actually better tools out there to get those numbers now, right? That's, that's where I create the dashboard. Um, they're one of those new tools. So the reason I'm good at what I, what I do is because growing up in accounting, I was in small business saying small business needs this, they need this, they need this. Here's how they not only get that, that data and that information, but what here's I how they get it simply so they're not like having to spend hours and hours and hours every month just to know their numbers. And then the final piece, what do I do with that? What actions do I take based on the information? And so really from the beginning of my experience in accounting, it's been in small business and it's been, how do we take this whole skill of accounting, this whole skill of data analysis to a small business and say, you use this to make more money. And so that's, that's what I focus on. What happened in your life personally or professionally that most explains why you're doing what you do today. All right. I will, I will be honest about this one. I, when I was in my late twenties, mid to late twenties, I don't remember exactly though. Uh, I had four kids 
and they needed to eat and they needed new shoes. And I think at that point, one of them definitely still needed diapers and it was really expensive. And as I looked around for work, just a typical job thinking, because again, if this is the point where I had failed two businesses and I wasn't gung ho about starting the third, I look around at jobs and I'm like, I don't know how people can afford to, to live like this. Right. Uh, I, I, you know, a family of six, my wife and me and our four kids, and a mortgage and two car payments. You can't do this on a salary. Anybody's willing to pay me. I just don't know how people do it. And so I feel there was, again, so much more leverage in working for myself. Uh, and so I honestly, there's, there's not a lot more to it than that. When I, when I talk about it with my wife, uh, you know, I'll say, gosh, if, if we weren't married, you know, if I had, had stayed single for a lot longer, my liabilities would be a lot smaller. Like I wouldn't have had that mortgage, wouldn't have had those kids. And yet, because of that situation, believe me, I was motivated to produce. <laughs> I had to produce, I had to make money. And now three of my kids are out of the house doing a lot better with only, you know, my wife and one kid than I was ever doing with four kids. But I would never have had to risen, had to have risen to this level if it wasn't for that need. That's the truth of it. The day of celebration for all parents is when their kids grow up, uh, become independent adults and get them off the family payroll. So congrats on three out of four. Let's hope Thanks. fourth has a smooth ride to independence. Well, if I'm honest, once they're out of the house, they're not entirely off the family payroll. <laughs> Sometimes they need help with college or other things, but uh, it's not as nearly, as nearly as consistent as it is when they live with you. So, <laughs> Indeed. Um, any regrets? Um, lots of regrets. Sure. Uh, but you know, I, I had somebody once asked me like, if you can go back in your life and change one thing, what would it be? And I'm like, look, I am much more a product of my failures than my successes. Mm. You know, if, if my first business had succeeded, let's say it had succeeded, like we mentioned earlier, because I was lucky, uh, I would not be who I am today when I have the skills I have, when I have a lot of the relationships that I have. Um, so yeah, lots of regrets, lots of things that I wouldn't do again with the knowledge that I have, but would I go back and change things? I would say, no, probably not. If it meant I would have missed out on some of the life experience that I have and, and where I'm at now. One of the things I have seen over the years is successful people don't look at failure the same way, the, the same way that those who struggle do. Successful people look at failure as learning and therefore, mm -hmm. the whole goal is, is to fail, but fail quick, fail cheap. Yeah. Uh, you get the learning so you can go on to the next level. Yeah, and I think, but I think those that struggle are those that look at it as failure. And then it's, you know, woe is me, woe is me, what am I going to do? Uh, or they point the finger of blame outwards. And whenever you blame others for your failures, then I guarantee you, you are not going to learn. Kind of a big comment on that. I would, I would take it to, to a different level as well. Um, there are times when you can, you can have a failure that maybe it is somebody else's fault. Like I have, I'm trying to think if there's one I saw where someone in the, in the company did something illegal and it, and it affected you know, the, the owner of the company. Uh, but even then you have no power to change what other people do. And, uh, if you always look inward and say, okay, what could I have done differently? Right. Bit, have had better internal controls would have prevented, you know, that employee from doing something that damaged the entire company. That's the only thing you can do. Uh, simply saying, Hey, that was somebody else's fault. Yourself of any ability to, to change, change it or to grow from it. Uh, and I think that's where your, well, the growth happens, the, the improvement in your own life happens. I, when I was a brand new business owner, I knew because I'd read about failure, right? Like people say, Hey, it's okay to fail. That's just learning. But it's one thing to know it in your head because you read it in a book. But then when you go through that first big one, you, uh, you feel it and you, you think, boy, do I, do I put my tail between my legs and go back and get a job? Which I did before starting the next one and the next one. Uh, or do I just say, Hey, that's fine. That was part of the process. Gung ho, let's go forward. That's really hard. Uh, and so I think it's okay to take those breaks in between when you get, you got to get on your feet a little bit. But I think failing the emotional side of it, you've got to go through it to really understand that. And it's only at that point that, you know, 
hey, am I really going to go be an entrepreneur or am I just, should I just stop now and never try it again? And for me, I knew I had to go forward, but boy, it was hard. Amen. So Nate, what's next for you over the upcoming 12 months? Professionally, I'm just, uh, just growing my fractional business. Uh, my, my dashboard tool, I really believe in it. I really think there's a, a need for it. <laughs> and uh, I think I can make it work. So that's for me, it's just growing my clientele over the next year to create that business with, you know, all focused on that, that flagship product. I'm sure we have people in our audience that would love to reach out and have conversations with you. What will be the best way for them to contact you? Uh, one of two ways they can email me. It's Nate at zero to CFO.com or they can schedule a time to meet with me if they're interested in using my services or getting a dashboard. And they can do that uh, through my website. It's uh, zero to CFO.com. And we'll put all that in the show notes as an insert into the video. Nate, I want to thank you for being a guest on our Fractionals Unplugged show. Be sure to subscribe to both our podcast on all the major platforms in our YouTube channel for our videos. Until next time, make an impact on your clients and family on your terms, securing your independence with the freedom, flexibility, and control that you've earned.